So tonight, I want to talk a little bit, uh, I want to get started with some, some very basics, because I'm not sure what kind of audience we have here. Some people might have had exposure to BPM, they might know about what it is. Um, some might not know, so it's interesting to get started. But even those that know about BPM tend to differ their opinion, so it's always good to start with the basics and to, to give you my background on it or how I look at it and especially why you would do it. There's also some new trends in BPM and there's of course effective, uh, which I want to talk about. And when I talk about us as effective, that means uh, me, I was already introduced, so I uh, did some work in open source and now it started uh, effective. So in the open source projects, uh, Activity and JBPM, they were really created by developers for developers. And it's basically like a library that you can use in your applications that you are building as a developer. And now with Effective, we take a, uh, kind of a different perspective and I hope to, to, to bring you some uh, insights into that today and what that different perspective is. Um, so Effective's mission is basically to make BPM easier. DPM, I think the, the values are, are easy to understand, but often it's quite complex once you get started in those projects. And we see like there's a big gap and opportunity there to make BPM easier. And not only is there an opportunity and, and a need to make it easier, the time is also right because uh, with things happening on the cloud, uh, there's a lot of um, new opportunities there that make this the right time to build a solution that can be made a lot easier than before. And there was no better partner to do that with than Synavio because they already have a track record of building 500 customers in the last uh, five years. So they have like a very fast growing uh, BPM company, but they're focused on uh, the process modeling aspect. So creating those models, collaborating with peers to, to, to um, to discuss the models and to really sign off on the models. That's where uh, Synavio excels. And so they were also looking for a partner to get those process models executed. So that's what Synavio doesn't do and that's where the partnerships come in. Um, so for them it's very interesting to have a partner close, uh, closely aligned to, to execute the models you can build in, in Synavio. And uh, uh, also they invested in Effective. So they are investing party. Okay, let's get started. So what is BPM? Uh, business process management makes it basically easier and faster to automate repetitive work. Um, it mainly consists typically of uh, tasks that you allocate or delegate to people. And the, the engine, the, the workflow engine coordinates all the tasks that have to be done and you integrate with some enterprise systems. So after a certain task is done, you need to upload a document into the document management system, for example. So if there's an easy way, so BPM offers you an easy way to build those kinds of workflows. Um, a more practical explanation, just to, to, to give you an idea, a very, very basic, and a uh, fundamental um, aspect of BPM is the process. So a process has, uh, is basically a template for this repetitive work. And sometimes we see that people already have some difficulty distinction, making the distinction between the process as the template and the actual instances which, which have like, there's a lot of instances, right? So the process is the template, it has a graphical portion um, there's blocks and arrows, so it makes it easy that everyone involved can understand what's happening. And those blocks typically mean like a, a task that has to be done by a person or some interaction with a system in your uh, enterprise IT environment. Uh, a good example of a process could be a hire because you regularly hire or at least if business is going great, then you regularly hire new people into your organization and it's each time uh, similar tasks have to be done, and it's the same flow that you want to execute. Right. 
And then once you have this process and the, the solution makes it easy to create these processes, then you can start uh, cases which are also known as process instances. Um, so then each case, and then for the example of hiring, you have like hiring Jack, hiring Joey and Mary, those are individual cases. And so each case brings together an, the, the people involved, they have a number of tasks, and uh, they have a, a central place where they can collaborate and where all the information for this task is brought together. That's what we call a case. Also central to the idea of BPM is agility, meaning that um, the BPM solutions have a way of publishing new versions. So as you learn more about your organization or if you just have an idea on how to improve your process, BPM makes it very easy to create those uh, or to, to, to update and improve those processes and with a push of a button, uh, they get rolled out. And if you compare that to software releases, that's typically a lot more involved and there's a lot more, uh, a lot slower cycle to get in an enterprise new versions of software out versus uh, process management. So that's also a function that, that often is done by BPM. Like if you make a process out of it, then business can uh, move forward and iterate and improve much faster than if you would do it in, in plain software. Um, why would you actually do BPM? So one very uh, simple reason is, of course, to coordinate those tasks, right? Uh, you can specify who does what, and you can get rid of the miscommunications that happen during handovers. Even that alone will save often like huge amounts of work. Uh, a couple of miscommunications, there's like work waiting. The, the, the previous guy says, I, I told you so. The other says, I don't know that I have to do something. Figuring out those kinds of communication and correcting this is like very expensive. And just creating a process actually shares with the other people the expectations that you have. You, you say to the organization, no, I expect you to do this first and then you have to do this. And if that's made clear, that already uh, is like a very big step forward. BPM also lets you uh, enforce the right level of control. And I'm, I'm explicitly mentioning the right level. Uh, BPM has been very well known to be used in compliance, meaning that as a, as a manager or as a boss, you say, for this particular task or for this particular piece of work, we, we must have these tasks completed, then we must have this task completed, and uh, the people, the, the employees, should not do it any different because that's how we guarantee the quality. So that compliance is really uh, important. BPM is used for that and it's very good for that. But what's recently been added is we should also leave enough freedom where it can. So a lot of processes don't have these stringent uh, rules where, where people can't think, right? More and more we see the notion of caseworkers, meaning that people are nowadays, with all the IT infrastructure that is available in the enterprise, people are more informed. So you, you can keep track of what's going on, everyone's more informed, so everyone can make better decisions on their own. And as a result, that means that people can make uh, individual choices and you can leave them the freedom. And for BPM, that means that you can limit yourself to the, the higher level tasks and all the work underneath, you can say, okay, I leave it up to the people to decide how they think to do that, uh, how it's done best, and they can work it out. So another uh, way of looking at it, you can uh, present checklists. You can just present them with the, the 10 possible tasks that they can do, and you just let them off skip or check off the tasks that are not relevant. So that kind of uh, extra freedom is really uh, interesting. And so you might have heard about case management. It's really like blending case management into business process management. Uh, that's really uh, key and that we saw recently as a, as a trend in BPM systems. So without transparency, um, without that trans transparency of the expectations, um, Employees don't know what's expected of them, and managers don't know what's happening in the organization. So that 
but can lead to very dangerous situations. So you might as well want to get some insight there. Um, you also want to do BPM because you want transparency of what actually happened. You might have nice plans and those uh, piles of paper that Jonathan just talked about that usually end up in the cupboard and behind the desk and no one uses them. Um, but then people start doing stuff and they find all kinds of solutions and then eventually some problem pops up. Someone has a, a why is this customer not being informed about this change? Okay, then you want to go and trace back. And this is a really important step because if you cannot trace back to what the root cause was, you cannot learn as an organization and you cannot improve. But it's really important that you have a central place because think about how would you start digging and finding the root cause if all the communication has happened in emails and then you need to talk like to the other guy, like where I sent you an email. Oh, that's really hard to start tracking and getting uh, to the root cause if you have to talk to all the people. And the BPM system makes sure that you have all that kind of information centralized in one place. And if some decision is really important, you can really explicitly make a decision in the workflow so that you know that each time this decision is being traced and being recorded, if you want to know it, you, have, you know the place where you can find it. So that's really important. There's a lot of other, so all the rest of the uh, advantages and why reasons why you want to do BPM. I've tried to summarize them in a, in a very overcrowded slide. Um, one use case that made it also very clear to me that BPM sometimes is really the right and the only solution to, to think about a certain problem is when you have like, when you're responsible to organize the handling of insurance claims. And you have like 5,000 claims coming in every day. And you have 300 people that are supposed to help you process all these claims. If you think in that scale, there's no way one person can start thinking like taking them in and delegating. And uh, so you need to think in terms of processes, how, what has to happen when an insurance claim uh, has, to handle, has to be handled what are the different tasks, and then a, a BPM and a workflow system can keep track for every individual claim, like, okay, you're doing this task for this claim, these two people are involved, and we're waiting for this other uh, task to occur, so uh, keeping track of that can be really uh, a challenge, basically, if you don't have a BPM system. Um, monitoring progress on a higher level. So if all these claims are being handled, you want to, of course, start tracking um, how many are open for longer than five days. Those can be uh, SLAs you want to meet, and uh, that's, of course, very valuable, and that's information that just, if you work with processes, that information becomes available very natural and very easily, rather than having to start uh, building lots of code to, to extract that information. Another very pragmatic and simple reason to use BPM system is chasing distracted employees with reminders. So a lot of managers, they don't have a, a big portion of their time is spent delegating tasks to someone and then two days later asking why they didn't do it and chasing them and chasing them over again. So if you can already offload that piece of work to the process engine and say like, okay, I dedicate, uh, I create a process, there's a task for you, uh, the system will send you a reminder after uh, every day, and if you didn't do it by day number five, escalate to me. So now I can, as a manager, relax, and I can do something else, because I know the task will come to me if the other guy doesn't do it very easily. Uh, consistency. So... In a lot of processes, it's very important that every process is handled the same way. If you, as a customer, uh, file a complaint, you want to have that being dealt with always in the same manner that creates a level of quality. For a lot of quality, um, for a lot of quality metrics and for SLAs, also there a process is, an, is a very simple and easy way to uh, make sure you deal with it. And of course, it's cheaper than custom coding. And that's also, there's always like a, a balance and a kind of a 
discussion going on. Even recently, there was a big blog war basically going on in the, in the in BPM space about coding versus no coding in BPM. And actually, it's quite simple. It's like uh, BPM always had the promise that that you could do, you could build some a working solution without coding. And so the guys involved in BPM, they question a lot, like, can it be done? No, it cannot be done, and all that. Okay, well, the thing is that if you want a very basic, simple process, it can be done without coding. If you make the process simple enough, just delegate three tasks to someone, then every BPM system can do that without coding. But of course, if you want, often that's not sufficient. Often you want more complex integrations or some customizations, and then it depends on, on which system you're using, on how uh, easy you can get that done or when you st should start coding. If you want a very customized solution in the end, right, then you might actually need some, some coding, but then the workflow engine that you're using will take away a lot of the coding already. So you reduce the amount of code that you have to write. Uh, because sending those reminders, if you can create an easy email template, uh, and if you can specify when the reminders have to be sent, just like coding, sending of an email takes already half a day or a day, so if you can just configure those kind of things, delegating the tasks, uh, chasing, let's say, or changing from one task to the other, those are things that if you have to code all that, it will take you a lot of time. So all those functionality that can be done by the engine can be saved. Okay, what's changed recently? So there's a number of things that over the past five years basically have, have changed the, the landscape in which uh, BPM is positioned. Um, and the biggest change is cloud. Cloud is kind of a, like a something that has a lot of meanings, right? And I'll, I'll highlight a little bit the different kind of impact that cloud has on BPM. So there's uh, certainly like cloud services. So there's a number of things in enterprise IT that have been added recently. So every organization will typically adopt some cloud services, software as a service. Like Salesforce, for instance, is added in many organizations as one of the solutions they use. There's bring your own device. Everyone now has their own devices. You want to start using them also for your work. So that means that a lot of the information in the typically VPN protected enterprise now have to be exposed somehow uh, to the mobile devices. Now all of this doesn't mean that the IT infrastructure gets replaced. No, this is just added. And so the enterprise IT environments, they are growing to become more complex. And a normal organization will be having a hybrid or a hybrid IT enterprise environment where there's SaaS solutions, there's a mobile portion, and there's on-premise and, and VPN still around. So it doesn't get any simpler. Now, that's already like one note in terms of effective because this has changed recently. Effective is really a solution that's built for this kind of environment. It takes the lessons learned and the new opportunities and challenges into mind to uh, when we've created it. All right, and of course, for those, look, uh, Effective itself is like really focused on the cloud because we want to make it easier. And if you just have to register an account to start working with a BPM solution, that's much easier than if you have to ask your IT guy to set up uh, a BPM system because they need to download it, they need to install it, and just like the cycle, when you say, can you install one of these systems and when you can use it, that's like a big cycle. Registering an account takes you a minute and then you have your system. So, so we believe that cloud is a very important instrument to make BPM easier. Nevertheless, there's a lot of organizations that want full control. They say, no way, we're going to use software outside of our VPN. Okay then you can install it yourself as well, but it's gonna be taking you a lot more uh, effort. And if you want to spend that effort, you can do that. Okay, and a totally different aspect of cloud that has a big impact on BPM going forward is 
the focus on user experience. Um, the focus of user experience is very uncommon in enterprise applications. So uh, in consumer applications, it's been already adopted and all, pe people there are already aware that if you can make it easier for people to consume your application, then more you will go viral a lot faster. Right? So that's why consumer applications are uh, jumped on the, on the user experience already a lot earlier. Enterprise software has had a bad reputation in terms of user experience, and I think BPM typically has been the worst of the class. So, uh, so there's a lot of room for improve, improvement, I think. And <coughs> one service was really an eye-opener when I saw it, and that's, I, I really like to refer to it because it's if this, then that. So whom of you is already familiar with the if this and that service? Okay, not too many of you, so I'll explain it in a very short sentence. So the service allows you to create recipes. Each recipe is basically a process of a trigger and an action. You can configure if this happens, then do this action. Nothing more. And triggers can be things like an email arrives in your inbox or the weather turns uh, sunny, or it's gonna rain where I am in the next half hour, or uh, whatever. I'm being mentioned on Twitter, could be an, a trigger. So all of these things are events, and they have a massive amount of events, of all the cloud services out there. Ah, right, another one could be in uh, Google Drive, a new file appears in this folder, right? Th those are the type of triggers. Now for all of these events, you can couple a single action onto it, and the actions might be send me an email, um, add a lead to Salesforce, or any action that you can think of in your organization. And then you can start combining those. So if you, it took me, a, took me a while, but it was an eye-opener to see that this is actually a very small process, only limited to a trigger, one action. And what they do as a result is, first of all, the integrations they do are real integrations. So, uh, and secondly, the user interface that they've built for it is really user-friendly. I've heard in a blog post, the reporter, which is non-technical, so like a writer for a newspaper, she was able to turn her light from, like, flash it in blue whenever she got mentioned on a tweet. It takes her five minutes. This is something that normal people without a service like this, if they had to start coding and using the APIs, they wouldn't be able to do that. And so they really showed that even on integration level, not only on the user orchestration, but also on the integration level, you can make it user friendly. And that's the takeaway which, which we also saw coming and which, uh, which is one of the reasons why we uh, started Effective. We want to bring that kind of user experience into BPM. Okay, another topic for what has changed. There is another, um, there is another concept that over the past five years has popped up which is really relevant for BPM. Um, it has to do with, with email and plain communication and discussions and um, there's, yeah, basically there's a lot of email overload. Email has sometimes, uh, with real ambitious people, I was a bit ambitious in the beginning, uh, and I tried also to say, like, let's ban email because it's bad, there's better alternatives. Well, you cannot get rid of it because it's the least common denominator. Everyone has email, and there's certain use cases where this is just the most appropriate thing to use. Nevertheless, it's... Email is also overused in a lot of situations where you shouldn't use it. And uh, that one of those situations is what we call cases. It's where it's a, dis a rich discussion if you want to discuss something and you also want to share the context information and you want, let's say, later on involve a new person and say, get involved here, we were discussing this. If you do that with email, then you, ha you basically have to share all those emails in the other people's inboxes. 
right? And all the context information. So cases is, some, is, is a new concept that you can find in basically social networks like Yammer, Jive, and Huddle. It's something that you can find in, in task management solutions or shared collaborative task management solutions like Asana and there's a couple of others. Um, and, and essentially it's like one central place where you bring together a number of people, a single discussion and the context information relevant for the discussion. The context information could be some links to documents on the web, it could be some, some documents themselves or uh, whatever, whatever information is relevant right, to that uh, discussion. And it's a very important instrument and concept to get people on the same page, which is much more powerful than uh, doing all of that inf communication over email. All right. So these are all the things that have changed, some important concepts. But what uh, is the current pain point of BPM? The current pain point is that the diagrams are really nice. A lot of people say, OK, I want these diagrams that look simple. Managers can understand them. And they say, why well, I want this. And this is what BPM systems have been promising for a long time. And the demos will show you, by the way, just like my demo in a, in a while, but actually we think we can do more than just the demo. Um, and when the managers get excited, they say, okay, let's go for it. We want this solution. And in the first real life solution, they say, duh, it becomes an IT project. So we still need IT's involvement and we can't really get the agility that was promised in the first place. So and I think there we have some, some, some new and exciting ideas of how we can separate the business user experience from the developer user experience in one product. So IT involvement. Um, getting IT involves, involved requires a lot of overhead. You might not think of it that way at first, but just the communication alone that you have to set up to, to express to a developer all the things you want as a manager. And then typically the manager, when the result comes back, is like, okay, this is not really what I've asked for. So just the whole requirements process and developers also know this is really tricky to get, to build the right stuff that was actually wanted in the first place. And if you get it wrong, then, um, yeah, there's like a big risk that the outcome is, is, is not right and that's like a huge cost. Well, actually, the point is that for bigger projects, getting IT involved is the right thing to do. It's costly, but sometimes you need it. So, um, and what, what Effective's focus is, is to just add a section to BPM. So, where, whenever, uh, so the section we want to add is that for simple processes, the business people can actually build and run it themselves. But for more complex processes, we still have an API so that developers can customize and work with it as well, just like it was uh, the case in the past. So just to visualize that, we believe that currently BPM has just served the small circle in the middle, and that means like getting business and IT on the same page. Making sure there is a diagram that they can put in a meeting table that everyone can point with their finger on the diagram say in this step things are going wrong or this step things have to be done differently. That's the big benefit of uh, BPM so far is that you create a common language which is the process diagram so that IT people and uh, business people can actually do better communication. This works really well in big projects with long cycles. But where we see the big opportunity with Effective is to scale beyond that and also uh, enable business people to just like very fast and easy uh, and have the control that you actually want. So automate your own workflows with Effective. It's never been easier. Just to put some more emphasis on that. Um, I'm going to show you just in a minute that it's, of course, easy to coordinate some tasks and to do some handovers and to link it to some enterprise systems. All right, and it's going to be as easy as uh, Garfield would like it. 
So let's see. If, if I'm going to challenge the demo gods and do live demos, I'm um, pretty sure something will go wrong, but we never know up front what. So that always gets the attention, like what's going to go, what's going to go wrong. We'll see. Okay. So first I want to show you, uh, by, uh, by the way, you can just register an account and get onto the system right now. So we've been up and running since October last year with Effective. And uh, up to now, we're making it robust and, and scalable and really running it as a, as a software, as a service. And uh, yeah, and basically, ah, right. And the thing I want to mention was, of course, that you can just register. I think I mentioned that. So we were just looking at the task list. So you can see on the top there's tasks, uh, which is a combination of tasks and cases. We have the processes and we've got some examples. Okay, so the difference between tasks and processes was clear from what I said earlier. And I'm gonna show, uh, start with showing you, uh, I just create a single task, right? I'm gonna hire uh, Joey. This creates a task, and this task can be broken down into subtasks. So it's actually becoming kind of a case because I can say um, an interview needs to be done, um, a contract needs to be created, and the what was the other thing? An email account needs to be set up. So I can just break it down. I can say, hey, Mary. So I can just on the fly involve new people into this case. Uh, can you take care of the contract? Right. Um, and then she could reply, I'm not gonna switch the accounts because that's too easy. Um, she could say, uh, I'll, or I could say I'll also uh, upload the template, for instance. And then I could do like, is there a contract template? Yes, I just assigned the document. And this is, this is what you could call a case where you have a number of people involved. Uh, you could assign the, the, this task you can break it down into subtasks. Ah, and the nice thing is also that each individual task here, it can be as simple as a checkbox item, every task, but if you want to break that down further, you can open up a single task, and that on itself is a collaboration space. So you can start break it down further, like um, get the details, Edit the document, save it. I don't know, but that's uh, you can break that down further, right? And what was ah, the other thing I wanted to show here is that on the right we have a stream of all the things that happened for this particular case, and. By default, we show it as an audit trail. We show everything that happened, but of course, sometimes you just want to focus on the conversation, um, which is typically what you normally, or as an alternative, would find in your inbox. You could also just have a list of all the documents that were referenced in, the, uh, in this case, or you could just show everything in there. So, and, and this is basically all ad hoc, there's no process involved, but this already can be quite useful to coordinate tasks on the fly. And, and when you have this instrument and you put processes as next to it and nicely integrated, it means that you can go from highly structured repetitive work and you can do the, cover the whole range up to a one-off tasks that you want to collaborate on. So you don't need to choose your solution like for one-off we need to do this, for process we need to do this. You can, it's like a nice blend.
So now I'll show you what happens when, okay, this was one hire. What if we envision or expect multiple hires to happen in the future? Let's see if I can uh, automate that a bit or make my life simple. And I'm gonna start on purpose very easily so that you can see a couple of aspects. So first process is a hire process. Um, ah, I um, am showing this because with Effective, we focused a lot on user experience, as I already mentioned. And this is one of the things which we really um, get a lot of consistent feedback that Effective helps them build processes. Once, once they get started on creating a process, there's a lot of guidance. So it just says, ask you the question, like how do you want new hires uh, to get started? It's either manual, then you start the new process in the application. Um, you can just automatically start a new process when an email arrives and, or in this case, when a form is submitted. But this list is, of course, as I uh, just explained, if this, then that. Uh, the idea is there, this list is gonna grow. There's gonna be a lot of triggers in your enterprise IT systems, uh, like documents entering into some folder in uh, a document management system and other kind of triggers that are going to populate this list. And we also, are working on, uh, or not working on, we actually have an API now that allows you to add uh, new triggers for your specific use case. So if your organization says, we have these triggers that we want to use in processes, you can start adding your own. The same for the actions. Okay, but let's start very basic. We, we use the manual trigger, and we then ha can compose a number of actions. So what uh, do we want to compose here? We have the, uh, ah, right, in the actions, we have two modes. We have the very simple, by default, the, the, the action list, and we have the advanced flows. So for us, the diagram is already the advanced way, and the simple action list is the very basic way on how you get started. So you start with creating a user task and say, okay, for every hire, we want to do an interview. Then we want to do the contract, just like I had before, and the email account, also really important that we do that each time. Okay. So, and just adding those three tasks, just like this is sufficient, you can already publish and run your first process. Note that publishing is like for me as a developer, always feels good to press the publish button. Because if you do that with software, it's like packaging, it's deploying, it's making your server, it's, it's setting the logging up, it's, it's like for a developer, once he, the first day for a developer usually is like customizing the editor. That's where a typical software project starts for a developer, right? And this is all built into the publish button. So it's a, it's a nice button to click. Anyway, so when I start a new process, you get like the first hire. Uh, let's hire Joe this time, right? And then you get the three tasks, as I mentioned, then pre-populated. And I can say, I don't need this one, but I want a background check for this particular hire. So you can start adding your ad hoc tasks on the fly next to the tasks created and driven by the process. You can use the whole collaboration environment as I just showed it in the, in the process. So I think all the other features are pretty much clear. Right, also on the fly, I wanted to show that now as well. On the fly, I can go into the contract and assign it to Mary, for instance, and go back. So all of that doesn't have to be specified in the process. You can just do that at runtime as well. Of course, it's pretty basic, so we quickly have new ideas on how to improve it. So let's start to improve it. This time I'm going to switch to the advanced flows, which brings up the BPMN editor. And the first thing we're gonna realize is, okay, would be much nicer if we can do them in sequence. Right, so we just draw the transitions between them 
we publish this changed version and we start the process again. Um, let's hire Peter this time. So we see, of course, the first action, the first task is being done. When I check it off, the new task is being created and so on till all three are done. Okay, cool. Let's make another improvement to our hire process. Uh, the next improvement will be to add a decision. So now, ah, right. And this is one of the key challenges, or the key, not the key challenge, but the key targets we had, is that this editor should really involve no coding for approvals. So I'm going to add an approval here to show that non-technical people can actually build simple approval processes uh, already with Effective. So notify candidate. So suppose that um, after the interview, we have a human decision to say if it's approved, then you go to the contract, and if it's rejected, then you go to notify the candidate that he's uh, rejected. Okay, as easy as that. Mm, is that what I'm going to show? Ah, right. And just for the sake of things, I will, um, for showing this, I will say also that I will be the one doing the interview, and for the contract, it's me, Mary, or Phil. And what that means is that also here we specified, or we did like a lot of user testing to find out what really works. Um, we try to simplify to the simplest possible thing, but no simpler so that it actually works. And the, um, the assignment, if you just specify one person, it's really just assigned to that person, you become the assignee. If you select multiple people, they all become candidates to take that task. And then they all get an email like, um, you could take this task, and then the first one that takes it, he's got it, so there's a mechanism to, uh, to, to lock and to make sure that no two people start doing double work, basically. You can also start working with roles. Also here, we, we try to make it very intuitive to say, like, you can create a new role, but you can also say just like, oh, use the same assignment as this other task, and you can start from there. So you don't really have to uh, uh, start doing that. Okay. Let's get started with that one. So we publish, no, I don't have good names anymore, so let's hire number three. Um, okay, so the task was assigned to me automatically, and when I approve it, I can see, okay, there's tasks you could do next. Uh, I get an automatic notification, I can go to the contract, and of course this task is offered to three people, so I can take it. After I take it, I can complete it as well. And then it informs me about new stuff to be done. So let's see what other. Um, there's a couple of other things I'd like to show. All right, the ones that I saw said in the beginning. So, um, okay, let's add some more data to it, right? So let's say the. CV has to be uploaded, um, and the candidate's email address has to be uploaded. So you can quickly like add a form to the task. You can say, okay, I want some reminders on this. So the due date is actually one day, or let's say one week after it started, start reminding after two days, remind every day, and if it's not done after six days, let's say, then escalate to me. So that's how easy it is to, to configure all that and to have the peace of mind that you can just concentrate on other stuff. Um, 
Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. So I'll publish this just to show you that the form is now integrated. I can upload some signed contract or it should have been the CV, but anyway, you enter the candidate email and that's how you can start using that information. I want to show you, show you one quick other example. Um, yep, oh, not here, sorry. Which is the contract approval. Correct approval. So in this case, I start the process. So in this case, the trigger is the form. So you have to set the contract and mm, 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 yeah, that's about it. All right. Right. I could also do a choice and say not only the country is important, but also in which country this is done. And I could say France, Belgium, of course, and ooh. Belgium and Germany. All right. So then when we go to the next step, we can uh, 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 do like a review step. And let me actually, I should switch to the advanced flows because I want to do a review. I then want to have an automatic decision basically that uh, not this one I want to uh, 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 sorry for this I didn't want a user task but I want to Google Drive so I want to show how it works when we start integrating because this is what I think is really interesting it shows uh, the vision so we worked it out really nice for one but from now on forward, we're going to add one integration after the other. And uh, this is just to, to, to show you the concept that we have in mind. Um, so let's create a new integration. So we're going to connect to Google Drive. And this is done through OAuth. I'm not sure if you're familiar with OAuth, but it's like an authentication. It's kind of like single sign-on, but then between applications. And what I now do in these couple of clicks is I actually establish the integration. So if you want to integrate two enterprise systems in the past, it's like a, a big work. And here, we, because of this standard and the open APIs that the two, the two solutions have on the cloud, it can actually be done in a couple of clicks. This is one of the really big opportunities uh, moving forward in the cloud. As more solutions are uh, available there, the integration becomes a lot easier as well. So I configured it and I say, okay, when the contract is uh, approved, I want to upload it to my uh, contracts folder. And actually the contract field from the form is given as the um, the thing to upload. All right. Now, uh, 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 extra, um, yeah, didn't prepare this very well, so meaning that I don't have the exact meaningful names, but I just wanted to show you that you can actually also do a human decision to say, ah, this is also something which I'm really excited about. So this topic or this session today, it scratches the surface. But what gets me really excited is to make BPM simpler, we had to come up with a good solution on how to manage the data. Because that's what we saw in the past. Always when data management comes into play, that's when it gets really technical. And so here you can see like a glimpse of what we're doing in the back, which is you have a file, it is the, uh, the contract, and you can here see that you can start working with the file uh, name and the content type and some other properties of the file, or you can just select the country as well uh, to start working with that. 
So if the country equals uh, France, then we're going to do an extra review and otherwise, oh no, if the country equals France, then we're just going to do the upload and otherwise we're going to do an extra review. Right? But that's something I wanted to show as well. Okay, so I've published it. I'm going to uh, just take the same signed contract again. <coughs> yeah, let's do France. Uh, yeah, because it's always interesting if we can see. Uh, there's the review task. Uh, and also here you can see that if you have modeled a form in your process and someone filled in a form, it also appears in the stream. So you can see who filled what data. Um, so when we complete this task, it goes through the automatic decision, comes at the upload. And when we refresh, we see here that the signed contract was uh, updated. When you click it, you can download it immediately from Google Drive. But just for the sake of it, I'll just show that it also went into my contracts folder. So it's, ah, so it's already 810. So maybe we should leave it at that. So I hope that this has given you some inspiration where we're going with Effective and uh, inspired you also to get more involved into BPM. So, uh, with that, glad to take any questions you might have. Do you have examples of more complex processes? Uh, not on my machine. I could browse. Uh, no, not that I. Let's. I can look for that afterwards to see if I, otherwise I'm here scanning, so not by heart. Uh, you could, ah, so one of the things that Activity and JPPM will not give you is on the use end user perspective, the data manipulation, as I just said, because there the data is always Java on the back end, so which is, uh, for the developers it might be nice, but then the, the business people cannot complete that process. Um, you have to create that object. Yeah, you have to do some... You have to deploy, typically, yourself, the whole solution. Um, so, there was, ah, right. And you reminded me also of something I wanted to show. Uh, so, it's a hidden link. So, if you really into the documentation of the Effective REST API, so Effective has a whole REST API, so everything which you just saw runs in the browser and talks REST API to the backend. So everything you can just start integrating. You can build your own task list, integrate those into your application. Uh, there's just not a link yet because this is not our focus. There's no link yet from outside, but you could see like there's like if you want to build those processes, uh, if you want to manage your task lists, like uh, get tasks, there's like posts, you create like publish new documents on tasks. So everything which you just said could be uh, could be then as well by the developers. Yep. So the only thing we have at the moment is this API. So you would have to code against this API to load this data into it. So that would mean like doing a REST call for every instance you want to start. When you are on PS, what is the technical architecture? The technical architecture is that you would need a database, MongoDB, and uh, the application server, and that's Tomcat. And could be any could be other uh, server. 
Uh, if it runs a WAR file, normally yes, but we only guarantee it on Tomcat. No, so. no restrictions in platform? Uh, or? No. We support Windows and Linux officially, but given the experience I had from the open source uh, in terms of how to make sure it runs everywhere, is to limit the number of things you use internally. So we, we, we really stick within the servlet environment and we don't do special stuff like uh, application server container stuff which is really different from one to the other. So we just stick with the war environment which should be very portable. And so we have like a basic set that we support, like I said, like Linux and, uh, and Windows, but of course in the early stages as we are now, we're very open to work with everyone to just make, make it run wherever it needs to run so that we can add that to the list. All right. Say that again? Could you show you web sounds code with uh, JavaScript too? Not sure from, what you uh, No, from the, the effective, um, I mean the effective palette. And, um, ah. The other way, I think uh, JavaScript. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, okay, uh, okay, okay, you okay. Can, uh, you can call uh, REST sounds. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's a nice feature. Yeah, something which I didn't show yet. Um, so there's like a combination. Currently, it's still in one palette, but as we're improving, it might be that the JavaScript gets hidden under a section called for developers, right? Uh, but we want to make sure that also developers uh, can do their stuff. And, all right, actually, it's been a long time I've worked on it, so yes. I forgot about it, but it's actually really neat. Um, so you can run some JavaScript as part of your process, of course. And the nice thing is that you don't have to step through executing. So developers, first of all, there's like a, an IDE, like the ACE editor is built in, so you can just type away. Um, you have your contract and your uh, country variables made available, and you can actually do some code completion here. Yeah, or let's say the country and also the variables are code completed. So that's nice, so you can give like a, a, a test value here and you can just say test it. All ah, right, but then I need to start, of course. That's the demo gods, yes, finally. In France we call it the bon idea. <laughs> journalists that used to uh, demo on TV and always fake. <laughs> In fact, regularly fake. All right. But I'm always very happy that I can actually uh, fix it while the demo is running. So, um, so yeah, there you can see that you can log it, you can run it, you can test it locally like the developers want and then the uh, business <coughs> guys can use it. So. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Do you have some deadlocks? Because the bots are taken over in our That's in the works. That's a very important and interesting feature. Um, so, so we're currently building like the, yeah, the basics like um, how many processes are still open, how many of that, and then the next step would be the nice graphics on top. But that's something to be expected in the next one or two months, basically. Ah, just thought of something that my presentation after the demo had two more slides. <laughs> one is that we already had some nice uh, confirmations that we're on the right track. 
So the first one is that uh, Gartner, which is like a really highly regarded analyst firm, has uh, given us the label of cool vendor in business process management this year. And what's really cool is that we are the, uh, we're the first company that gets it so early in the game. So normally there's like companies that are around for a couple of years. So we just launched like one or two months and we were in the report. So we were really happy about that. Also when we launched TechCrunch, which is in Silicon Valley, kind of like a very uh, big news outlet, uh, picked us up immediately and did a cover story on us. So that's uh, like we were really happy with uh, both exposures. So. so yeah, with that, uh, make sure you register, you try it out, and uh, let us know what you think of it.